talk about inflation. Right here, I'm going to give you some of my own insider secrets. We start with a chart going back to 1960 to 2020. This is the official rate of inflation. Starts very low in the 1960s. Then we know what happens in the 70s. Shoots way up, comes back down. 1980, almost up to 15%. Volcker puts the brakes on. Since then, according to the official numbers, inflation has been very tame, under 5%. The problem is they changed the way they measure inflation in the 80s and the 90s. And of course, each time they changed the way they measure it, it adjusted the rate down. The easiest way to get your mind around this is if you have two of the exact same people. In this time frame, we measure that person's weight in pounds. They weighed 220 pounds. During this time frame, we measure their weight in kilos. So they weigh 100 kilos. This person weighs the exact same. But what the government says is that they actually weigh less because over here they weigh 220 and over here they weigh 100. In other words, if you would have measured inflation from 1960 to the beginning of the 1980s, the same way that we measure it now, let's say in kilos, the inflation rate would have been just as low as it looks from this time frame, and vice versa. From 1990 and on, if you would have measured inflation in pounds, the way they did from here to here, the inflation rate would have been just as high as it was in the 1970s. So you're really left with one of two choices. Of course, the history books tell us that 1970s, oh boy, that was really bad. In the 2000s, all the way to today, well, that inflation, that was actually really good, nice and stable. But if they were measured the same way, we know that you'd have one of two choices. Either both levels of inflation were very low or both levels of inflation were very high. I'll let you decide which one is true. Now let's get some of Rick's incredible insights on inflation from my full length interview with him that'll be posted to the channel tomorrow morning. I've used this example many times, but maybe it's new to your listeners. On my way to work every day, I drive past a wonderful establishment called Motel 6. Mm -hmm. When I was a young man, I had occasion to stay there, uh, not infrequently. And it was called Motel 6 because a room at Motel 6 cost $6 a night. Mm -hmm. Today, I when I knew that. Yeah. Today, when I drove by the establishment, the sign said Motel 6, $64.95. In other words, <laughs> Motel 60. Now, there's only two explanations for this, George. One is that a room at Motel 6 could be 10 times more spacious and 10 times more luxuriously appointed. That's one option. Right. The second option would be that the purchasing power of the unit relative to acquiring a room night at Motel 6 could have depreciated by 90% over 30 years. I will admit to having done no recent due diligence on the size of the quality of a room at Motel 6, but my suspicion is that the reason that Motel 6 is now Motel 60 is as a consequence of the deterioration of the US dollar. Step number two, let's talk about silver. More specifically, the gold-silver ratio. Chart going back to 1970 all the way to today's date. Actually, I think that number is from 2019, so it might be slightly different now. This ratio tells us the number of ounces of silver required to get to the price of one ounce of gold. So where it's lowest means that the silver price is the most expensive relative to gold. 1970, right around there, 15.67 ounces equaled one ounce of gold. 1980, 15 
0.3. I'm guessing that was because of the two brothers that tried to corner the market. 1990 silver gets super cheap. A hundred ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. That takes us where we are today. Again, very cheap. Almost 90 ounces of silver to one ounce of gold. Surprisingly though, Rick Rule doesn't think that's very important. He thinks maybe from a psychological standpoint it is, but from a fundamental analysis standpoint, it is not. The reason why is because silver is mined much differently from gold. For insight on that, let's go straight to an article from American Bullion. For thousands of years, mining silver was not that much different than mining copper, zinc, gold, or iron. Past prospectors and exploration companies sought out silver deposits, set up mines to pull the silver out of the earth, and then shipped it to the refinery. Gold, copper, zinc, and iron still get mined this way. By the 20th century, however, silver mining changed. A relatively small percentage of silver originates from traditional silver mines, approximately 25 to 33%. Nowadays, most of the world's new silver comes from mines that focus on other metals. For an example, a zinc mine in Mexico may pull out 65% zinc, 25% silver, and 10% lead. Since this mine is categorized as a zinc mine, the silver production is referred to as a byproduct metal. Most new silver is a byproduct. So analyzing the supply side fundamentals of silver is much more complicated than gold. And often it doesn't even have to do with the metal itself, but other metals that it's being mined with. But for all you silver speculators out there, I have got some great news. And that is when the price of silver does go up, the miners go up much, much higher relative to the price of silver than even the gold miners go up relative to the price of gold. So if you get it right, you are gonna make a ton of money. To understand this dynamic further, let's go right back to my interview with Rick Rule. The most volatile precious metals asset that I know of are the silver shares. Silver mm -hmm. itself is extremely abundant, but high quality silver shares are extremely rare. Later in a bull market, what seems to happen is that as the generalist investors come into precious metals, they become less attracted to the insurance aspect of, spec of precious metals and more attracted to the momentum and speculative aspects of precious metals. And there's no more speculative asset in the world than silver stocks. When the generalist money comes into the market, what happens is that the limited market capitalization available in decent quality silver shares is so constrained that, as my friend Doug Casey says, the flow of funds resembles attempting to siphon Hoover Dam through a garden hose. <laughs> <laughs> Step number three, gold. Rick Rule believes that there is an inverse relationship between gold and the 10-year treasury because they're competing safe haven assets. So he goes so far as to call the 10-year treasury the anti-gold. I have a chart going back to 1980 to today of the 10-year treasury. We go all the way from its highs of 15% down, down, down in a straight line. This is a classical downtrend in interest rates. Usually, these trends in interest rates, whether they're going up or down, last 20 to 30 years. We are 40 years into this downtrend. So the point Rick makes because of this inverse relationship, that if you believe we are closer to the end of these interest rates going down, then you have to believe we are closer to a massive bull market in gold where it goes straight up for the next 20 to 30 years. Oh, but wait, 
there is more. I've got more good news about gold when it comes to confiscation and the demand side of the gold price equation. For that, let's go right back to my interview with Rick Rule. The study suggests that uh, the asset class of precious metals, that is physical precious metals and precious metal securities, comprises between one third and one half of 1% of the savings and investment matrix in the United States, looking at all savings and investment products. Uh, the peak in 1981 was alleged to be around 7%. If we had mean reversion, which is what I am suggesting is a probability, what would happen would be that demand for precious metals and precious metals related securities would somewhere between triple and quadruple in the largest investment market in the world. If you're nervous about your government confiscating your gold, the easiest thing to do is put the gold somewhere else. Uh, right. That is not high among my concern for the following reasons. I'm not one who is generally guilty of underestimating the venal nature of politicians. <laughs> uh, I just look at incentives and a circumstance where they came to steal your gold might bring them uh, face to face with the fact that there are 400 million firearms in private hands in the United States. Uh, right. which would present a risk to them. I'd like to personally thank all of you who have taken the time out of your schedule to support the channel by watching the videos and commenting. And for those of you who have supported the channel through a PayPal donation, I sincerely, sincerely appreciate it. If you would like to start or continue supporting the channel through PayPal, we'll put a link in the description below. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out of control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.